I am Jake Naraki, and this is Operation Self Reset. What is going on, you freaking awesome people? Welcome back to Operation Self Reset. My name is Jake Naraki, coming to you live from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, where each and every week we dive into a deep topic in the world of personal development for you to become a better individual. Today we have an amazing interview with Wes Champlin. He is the co founder of a nonprofit called A Human Project. He helps young individuals in this world kind of bring out their internal power, greatness, if you want to call it that. And he really dives deep and shares his own personal story of struggle and along the way inspires them to open up and to understand what it takes to be a great asset to this amazing world. Along this journey, we dive into a topic of parenting, which I don't really hit on too much. Um, But Wes is a father of of two children um, and we kind of we kind of decipher what is going on with the next generation. And I think it's easy for a lot of people that are looking from the outside end saying, well, technology and drugs are the leading causes of irritation. And it's not so much that. It's a, a lot of things that uh, we'll, we'll get into. I don't, I don't want to ruin it for you guys. But before we get into the great interview, again, I just want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart for taking time and being a part of this journey in particular. Um, Operation Self Reset has been going on four years strong. And thanks for being a part of the journey. Uh, look, I know sometimes uh, the quality or the, the the sounds are not the most ideal but nonetheless um, I just tried to do my best for you juggling multiple things on my side to make sure that you guys are able to create a bigger big 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 impact on your side and so thanks that's all I just want to say thank you for being a part of the journey so with that being said I appreciate you and here's the interview with Wes Hey guys, welcome back to Operation Self Reset. We have an amazing guest. Wesley Chapman is an advocate for humanity. Wes believes that human beings are incapable of overcoming any type of challenge. He's the founder of A Human Project, an organization that develops scalable solutions to systematic problems and gathers together the greatest mind to solve global issues in education, health, and society. His work has been covered in Inc. Magazine, CBS, TechCrunch, ABC, Forbes all over the place. Wes, man, thank you for coming on the podcast and I appreciate your time. Hey, man, I appreciate it. I'm excited to have a convo. Yeah, so uh, look, you're doing some amazing things in the world today. You're you're speaking all over the place. You're trying to empower individuals. Uh, Give us a little bit of background on how you kind of stumbled upon this journey and why is it so important for you to get your message out there? Well, it's a pretty loaded question. Um, the reason it's so <laughs> <Yeah>. important, <laughs> you know, I mean, it's it, you've got a couple different levels of why it's important. The number one reason why it's important is because we're losing lives every single day, uh, categoristically, you know, and, and data and understanding where we're going in the world. We, the fastest growing sector of suicide in our youth is between the age groups of 11 and 14, which is just absurd. It's just crazy to even think about somebody that young and that innocent is already at a stage of not wanting to continue life. So, I mean, there's the, there's, there's the global uh, reason as to why we need to address these topics. And then there's the personal, uh, my story, where I came from. I was abandoned as a child. I was abused. I was neglected. I went through all, tor- all, all sorts of torture and it's very personal to me, and my life is a statement of proof to children and adults who have been through different levels of, of uh, trauma that you can create something magical, and you don't have to be defined by your past or, or your story. You can just use it to refine who you can become. And so, I mean, there's the global, like, we are in a situation right now that we need to not put our head in the sand. And, you know, it's it's not all doom and gloom, but it's it's also not all roses and cupcakes. I mean, we have to start paying attention to some of the issues that are affecting our children, the next generation that's supposed to take over leadership of this planet. And then the, the secondary level is, is that I've been there. I was one of those children, and I know how critical it is to have support and love and so it's it's just all a matter of taking those two things and then just putting out the 
you know, putting out as much content and as much material as I possibly can to reach those that are struggling. Sure. And you're a father, correct? I am. I have two beautiful children. And uh, yes, I'm, I am a father. Um, and uh, it's honestly, one of the greatest accomplishments in my entire life. There's a lot of accolades and a lot of things I've gotten in life. But to have the label, the the you know, the status, whatever you want to call it, of being a father and a dad is is by far the most personal thing to me. Again, diving a little bit into my story is that, you know, I was told at seven and a half years old, I was never going to amount to anything. And I wasn't told that by some, you know, parent or, you know, some angry adult. I was told that by a group of psychiatrists and psychologists and doctors who'd spent the last year, you know, going through my history and going through and testing my body and my brain and all of that to come out and for them just to basically say that I was a broken vessel um, and and I would never have a normal life. And one of those pieces in the document that they created was I would never be a sustainable or suitable father. And so uh, that that to me was one of those things that really hit hit hard for me. And to now be a dad is is just it's it's priceless. It's amazing. Cool. Yeah. And uh, congratulations on that. I'm a father of three young boys. And uh, yeah, it, it's uh, one heck of a journey and it's uh, amazing to be a part of it. Um, what I, I don't want to say what scares you, but what is concerning for you for your children and the next generation? Um, obviously, you see a lot of you're, you're working and, and talking and obviously sharing your story to, to allow people to open up and to show that things are possible in their own personal lives. But looking at the way society is bringing up this next wave of, of generation of kids, what, what are you fearful of or concerned about or things that you want to personally make sure that it doesn't affect your kids um, as greatly as it may affect other kids that are going throughout the, the same kind of growing process? It's a great question, and I'm a realist, so I don't... Um... I don't necessarily sit here and think that my children are not going to have to go through things. And in fact, right. I want them to go through things. I feel that it's through the pains, um, and I'm using air quotes, of life. That's where we grow. You know, we, we as human beings do not grow in, in comfortability. That is just not going to happen. And I wish it was differently. I really do. I, I wish it was, but it's not. So the realist inside of me is is that I am excited for the challenges that my my children are going to face because it's going to make them uh, you know, be able to become their, their full potential. And I know that may sound kind of crazy, um, but it's just how I think. And what I worry about uh, for society isn't necessarily the statistics and the direction. What I worry about is we're losing the art of communication. We talk a lot about how we communicate. Uh, we have a lot of ways. I mean, this is one right here. You and I are on this podcast, and right. I'm sitting in the middle of you know the forest in my cabin, and you're you know you're in your your office and you're doing your thing, and we have you know we're miles and miles away from each other, and we're communicating. But communication is more than words. Communication is more than 144 characters. And I, I'm very, very concerned that our children, our next generation, and even us as adults, and are losing the art of communication. We don't know how to talk to each other. We don't know how to read each other. We don't know how to experience those moments of connectivity. That's terrifying to me because it's in those moments that we create em empathy. It's in those moments that we create understanding. It's in those moments that we create love not superficial, I love you, you know, Twitter, hashtag, whatever crap, like, and, and we're losing that. And we say we're connected, but I really fear we're not connected. And that's going to have some effects that I don't think any of us can even fathom. Um, but if you study enough biology and you focus on, you know, the body, mind body connection, that is pretty terrifying. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. With, um, to, to be a very transparent, uh, I guess, uh, to take a little sidestep here, where, where is your cabin or where are you talking from? Do you mind sharing? Yeah, so I live up um, about 45 minutes from Kent from the Canadian border in a little town in Idaho. Um, so we are, we're, we're clear up and uh, my office, I actually uh, built a little cabin. Um, I'm looking at the pond right now in about, what time is it? 1014. So give or take an hour or so I'll have... Uh, uh, a moose, a bull moose, and uh, a cow, and then her, their calf will show up at the pond, and 
the mom usually goes for a swim and the baby and dad drink from the side. And I had a black bear the other day and we have elk and deer. And so I'm cool. very disconnected in my home life because I'm so connected, if you will, to all of, you know, when I travel and I go places. So when I say connected, I mean, you know, technology and all that. I mean, our town has a grand total of, of like six or 7,000 people in it, um, which is too big for me. So, you know, but, uh, <laughs> When you travel all over the place, it's nice to come home to something that's just a little bit more grounded. I, I, I hear you. Well, uh, you suggested I was uh, in my office. Um, I'm a city dweller. I'm, I'm here in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and uh, I'm actually in the basement in a bathroom. Every door closed because I got my uh, three young guns uh, causing havoc upstairs, so I got to isolate myself into my layer <laughs> of, uh, of of the, the restroom to do this podcast. But uh, like they say, you know, to have a good conversation, sometimes you need to separate yourself, and uh, good for you uh, of your location and, and experiencing nature at its finest. Um, let's go into the project that you co-founded, a human project. Um, look, there is a lot of great charities and ideas to make impact in the world, and especially like we just talked about connection and and you know in, in talking and, and kind of gathering different ideas. Why did you feel that you starting this this platform could be a great springboard into making a bigger impact in raising funds and, and distributing those funds around the country, around the world, and helping the next generation. I guess, where did that come from? And, and it kind of pulls through that story a little bit, please. So, you know, the honest answer is, is twofold. Number one, I never planned this. And number two, when I had the opportunity to kind of look at becoming, you know, I don't even like using the word motivation, but to, to becoming somebody who could motivate, how's that, um, the next sure. generation, it actually started with me and I, and I won't, you know, name the name of the organization, but it actually started with me kind of saying, Hey, um, I'd love to, you know, have a conversation about me coming in and, and being one of your speakers, being somebody who goes out into the field and, and, and taking one step back, I, I was a very successful entrepreneur, went through my own life stuff, um, that we talked about in my past entrepreneurialism kind of became my medication. When I realized that I took about a four year hiatus of just kind of figuring out like, what do I want to do in life? Where do I want to be? What, what's critical for me? And I went around and I met some great people. I interviewed a lot of people on the conversation of happiness and fulfillment. And I got into kind of like the self-help world and started meeting people like Les Brown and Brendan Burchard and Zig Ziglar before he passed and like all these different people. And everyone kind of in that world said, you need to be a motivational speaker, but that didn't feel right. So I was in this really kind of awkward stage, if you will, of figuring out what I wanted to do with my story and, and my success. And, and I happened to stumble across an organization that asked me to speak at a school. I spoke at the school. It was, I knew everything was in alignment. I knew it was perfect. There's a whole long, crazy story of how I got there. And so the first thing that happened is I went to that organization and said, I'd love to do this. Like, you know, I, I mean, I don't need to be paid a lot. I just want to do it. And when I went into the organization, it was very, the, the nonprofit world, and, and listen, I'm going to say a blanket statement, but I'm not putting the blanket over everybody, is, is absurdly, absurdly competitive. And not competitive in a good sense. Competitive in a sense of we have the only solution that works and thus cooper being cooperative is, is just not in our DNA. And I understand now why that's that way, because there's, you know, there's one dollar and it needs to be split between a thousand different directions. Sure. But that was my first taste of it. And so when I went into it thinking like, you know, nonprofits do good, they change the world, that's what we do. And if anyone wants to get involved, it should be pretty easy. But I do understand that I have a pretty powerful aura and I'm, you know, I've got a very, very big story and, and it may be to some, maybe it was too big. I don't know. But the nonprofit was super excited to have me in in the beginning. And then as we started going and the attention started kind of getting in, you know, like, wow, the story is powerful, blah, blah, blah. It just didn't work out. Let's just put it that way. And so okay. it was really out of frustration that I looked at it and I said, you know, this nonprofit world is is really kind of going in the wrong direction. And I reached out to some key people, uh, Gary Vaynerchuk, who connected me to uh, Pencils of Promise and, and Charity Water, both ran by amazing, amazing men who are, you know, making huge global impact. 
And I kind of went to them as mentors and, and I then looked at the industry that I wanted to target and I just didn't see anything that was doing it in a way that was no BS, you know, going at, going at the jugular, solving the problem, being in the trenches, having the, the, the infrastructure that they could be in the trenches. And what I mean by in the trenches is I mean, knees to knees with these kids. I mean, in the homes, I mean, like, and I could tell story upon story of now what we've done, but I didn't see that. I saw it in some sectors of the nonprofit world, but I didn't see it in the sector that I wanted to go after. And so it just kind of had to happen in my opinion. Now, you know, now that I've been out there and expanded more, I've seen a couple of nonprofits to do similar things to what we do, but very few of them are diving as deep as we dive. And there's a lot of reasons. There's a, there's a lot of scenarios. There's a lot of legal stuff. There's a lot of risk that we take, but to me, the risk is, is worth the reward. So it was this kind of, you know, double-sided thing. I, I wasn't looking to start a nonprofit. I stumbled into the conversation of motivation and motivator and self-help. I stumbled into the opportunity to, to align myself with another organization that didn't work out. I got incredibly frustrated. There's a lot of things that happened and a lot of pieces along the way that were kind of planting the seed for me to eventually start this human project, the, the company that we now run. And, you know, we look at it and we're very unique. We we're not scared. We use technology. We go after it. We're, you know, we'll go into communities that most people won't. We don't charge for any of our services, which is a uh, I've now found out is is we're a unicorn in that space. Um, and so there's just a lot of different things that we've done. But by no means do I look at it and say, you know, hey, if somebody came along and we wanted to cooperate and we could make a bigger impact, I wouldn't. But I've also realized that we've kind of created something that the, this particular marketplace hadn't really seen before at the level in which we do it. We're not perfect, but it's just it's just that was kind of the accidental coincidences that happened to create what what is now becoming something that is is creating a life of its own. And I'm now in this very awkward stage of business where and if you any of our, anyone's ever started business, our growth is is at such a exponential level that we have to now start getting pretty creative with how we manage that growth. So just, just things you have to worry about as you grow your business, but, uh, you should be, you know, as an entrepreneur, you get excited for that stuff as a nonprofit. It's, it's different because <laughs> you, you have to <laughs> raise more money. You know, it's not like, Oh yeah, we're selling more product. It's like, Oh crap, we're getting more responsibility and we need more people and we need more, you know, revenue coming in, AKA donations. Sure. So this is a 100% donation uh, thriving business. It is. We self, my, my uh, bride and I self-funded it for the first couple of years. And now it's, it's just gotten to the point uh, this last year. So 2017, we started something called Human Heroes, which is anybody's ability to sponsor a child. Um, you know, cool. we work primarily in the United States, so it's not cheap. You know, you, $30 does not feed them for 30 days kind of thing. And and I don't mean that as anything. I'm just being yeah. real with people. So, right. you know, we started that and that's great and that's working. Um, and it's just giving us the ability to be in front of more children and do more things. And, you know, the list goes on and on. Sure. Um, working with these these young kids, um, you know, what's uh, obviously I don't know your business to the 10th degree, but when you work with them, what are the reoccurring themes? You know, is there... You know, the children, they're, yeah. you know, they're depressed, they're angry, they're frustrated, they just don't get it. Um, wh what are they experiencing? So the reoccurring theme is expectations, really. Uh, expectations of every aspect of life. What is supposed to be love? What is supposed to be, you know, my grades? Where, what am I supposed to do in my life? Now, those expectations then manifest themselves in different ways. Depression, cutting anxiety, uh, overeating, undereating, you know, whatever it might be that they'll, <clears throat> they'll come out in different ways. And the management of expectations goes back to what I said earlier is the communication. We don't have the communication in the homes and that's the other, other side. I'm a huge data guy. I love data. I think data is what runs the world and understanding data is what creates solutions. And so we, we gather a lot of data and I, we do one-on-ones with any child that wants to, when we go into a school, we give a 45 minute to 90 minute keynote presentation 
We utilize NLP in a positive way um, where we actually get the children that <laughs> feel like, yeah, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, they, yeah, get the yeah. children to feel comfortable coming out and having a conversation. And we'll stay at a community, at a school until all the children that want to have a conversation come forward. Now, we're not talking about like kids that want to talk about, I mean, sometimes I'll get the child, uh, probably one out of 200 that'll come forward and say, I want to be an entrepreneur. How did you do it? Um, okay. But these are tra- these are traditionally kids that are coming and saying, I've never told my story of X, Y, Z, or I've told my story of X, Y, Z. So it's people that are coming forward and feeling comfortable for the first time to really dive deep. They may have superficially told things, but to really dive deep into what's really going on. And then our goal, and, and this is kind of getting a little bit complicated, but we have a whole system where when the child comes forward, we have a community system, we have ambassadors, we have a whole team that's put into place before we even go to the community that's ready to support these children. So what we find inside of all of this are these are these tie points, right? Things that whether we're in La Jolla, California, or we're in La Crosse, Wisconsin, which I've spoken there, so not too far from you. Nice. You yeah. know, wh- wherever it is, like what's what's happening? And it comes back to these expectations and then the management of these expectations and then who's supposed to manage these expectations in a child's development. Well, that's the parents, right? That's supposed to be the community. It's supposed to be that communication of, listen, you're good enough. You're worth it. You can make it. You're beautiful. All these tag phrases we hear all the time, but they start in the home. And what we are finding is that 90% of all the children that are coming forward and talking to us, it's not that they're a certain race or they have an income bracket that they fit into. No, it's all over the map on all of those, all of those demographics. What we're finding is parents aren't in the home. Parents aren't Mm -hmm. in the home and it can be dads in jail or it can be dads an entrepreneur and he's working 86 hours a week. Like it, it doesn't matter what it is. It's just that there's, they're not getting the time with their mentors, with their parents. And that is, again, another scenario of priorities. What's important to you? If you tell me that your children are important to you, then you better be investing the only thing that matters to your child, which is time. It's just that's how it is. You could you could literally take kids and put them in a thousand square foot or a 500 square foot home and all sleep in the same room and they would be happy and content and find a way to thrive and survive if you gave them your time. You can't give me an excuse as to why your time can be can be trumped by, you know, well, I give them this lifestyle or I do this or I do that or I have to do this or I have to do that. Your time is the most precious thing you can give to a child. I'm a dad. I'm not saying, you know, you need to spend 24 hours with them, but you need to be spending a lot of time with your children, especially in the developmental areas of zero to 16. Like that is crucial, crucial time. And what we're seeing is children who aren't getting that time are not able to manage these expectations. They're not understanding where their life can go. And what that leads to is cutting, depression, suicide, anxiety, you know, stress management issues, and so on and so forth. And, and here's the crazy thing. We're talking a lot about children. The same right. stuff happens in adults. The exact same ask. thing happens. Yeah. yeah. Same thing happens in, the, in adults. And, and the byproduct of our work is that we end up working with families. And the byproduct of working with families is that the adults then come to me and say, okay, this is what I'm struggling with. This happened in my childhood or this happened in my first marriage or this happened here and I'm carrying that into this, you know? And and, and that to me is just, is nuts. You know, you bring up the wilderness and I love to be out in the wilderness and do a bunch of different things. You know, if, if you think about hiking, if you think about just the concept of hiking, if every single hike you ever went on, all the stuff that you put in, right, or all the stuff that you took from the hike, whether it was acorns on the ground or whether it was some stick or whatever, everyone collects something when they go hiking. If you were to take all of that stuff, the stuff you took with you and the stuff that you picked up, and every time you went hiking, you just kept collecting to it and you used the same backpack and you never emptied the backpack and then you st- and you did that for five, six, seven years – it's going to be miserable hiking because you have all of this weight. You have all this stuff that you're carrying around. And that seems absurd. Like, why are you even talking about this, Wes? Well, we do that in our lives. How much stuff do you carry on your back through your hike of life? And you keep saying, like, oh, I'm worn out. Oh, I can't be a great parent. Oh, I'm you know frustrated in my work or my job. Come on. Like, you're carrying baggage. You're carrying all of this extra weight and you're bringing it into your present when it happened in your past. And, and that is so victim and it is such a debilitating position of your life. And so as children, 
that's happening for sure. And we can talk about that till we're blue in the face, but adults are doing the exact same thing. And guess what? They're reacting in very similar, in very similar ways before this this statistic that I talked about earlier in the show of 11 to 14 year olds suicide that being the fastest growing sector of, of, of suicide the fastest fastest sector of suicide four years ago was women between the ages of 35 and 50 so so hmm. just you know and that's still a large section of the population and and anytime I'm giving these statistics out I take military out of it just because that is kind of its own its own uh, sure. scenario it's its own data point. So when you stop and think about women between the ages of 35 and 60 being a top suicide category, that's mind blowing until you start realizing how much they expectations, lack of communication, baggage that they're carrying through their lives. And so it's just it's yes, it's happening with children, but it's happening with adults and then it's happening inside of families. And then it's creating this dysfunction that becomes generational. The beautiful thing about working with children is that their brains are so you know have so much elasticity with they they can change so quickly and it's so rewarding to see a child go from you know point like b- basically being in juvenile detention to you know being in their student council body the next year i mean and and i've seen that and i've seen those transformations and they're beautiful and they're amazing and they're powerful but that child just needs that mentorship they need that guidance and they don't need superficial bs they need real they need raw they need to hear the truth because they're living in a world that is full of superficial nonsense and garbage and miscalculated you know data and you know they just want real they just want raw they just want to hear it and and i'd argue that we're seeing more and more and more of our adult population get into the same mindset yeah Got a question for you. You're an entrepreneur. Uh, you, you've done some amazing uh, things in the tech space. You understand the the hours that it need that is needs to happen or needs to be invested for in an idea to manifest and to come of light of something of, of either materialistic in the form of money or fame or just a product or a service, whatever it is. And I agree with you 100 percent with the uh, spending time with our children. The problem that I see is that us as entrepreneurs or creative minds or individuals that want to achieve can just even be goal oriented personally it takes time to bring that to light how do you what do you say to that individual that says you know i i i of course i want to do a good job raising my kids but at the same time i have my own hunger to feed you know to to satisfy of of having, you know, or of building this thing or idea or whatever. What do you say to that individual to to find, aka, the biggest unknown question ever: balance when it comes to family life and work life? So my biggest my biggest kind of comeback to that is is what do you define success as? So and and again, everyone's going to define that. They should define it to their one-to-one relationship. Most people define it as to what the world deems success is. So then my second counterpoint would be, okay, but what is success to you? So success to you is is independently different than what it is to anybody else, and that's okay. So once you understand that, now you can set the groundwork for priorities. If this business, this startup, is a huge priority because it's giving you, and in your mind, it's a roadmap for you to do more, right? And that's usually the excuse is, okay, if I start this company and I work 120 hours this week and I really go all in, then in a year from now, 10 years from now, whatever, I'm going to be doing this. And there's great quotes and it's true and it's part of business, but you know, like spend 48 months uh, eating ramen and you'll eat, you know, caviar the rest of your life. Like, okay, I get that. I understand that hustle, all of that. That's all great. But it's all it's all predicated on what what is deemed as success, because maybe to me eating caviar isn't success metaphorically. And so, again, if it is, if it comes down to it and you have children. And speak really bluntly and it's going to rub some people the wrong way, it takes two to tango. You may have had an experience where you weren't planning on having a child, but you had an experience in which you enjoyed creating the child. Let's just get honest. We're adults here. We're listening to it, right? So, so right on, right on. That that is a choice that you made. Life is about choices, and I'm not going to use the word consequence because that's not the right sentence or the right statement. But I think everyone gets it. Life is about. Let's do it this way. It's about. It's about you know a choice with a reaction, and so. If you did made that choice, you now have another life that you created. 
Now, now here's 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 the asterisk to there. Fifty percent of the child that is in front of you as your child, if if everything went the way that it was supposed to, and you didn't adopt the child and all that, let's just stay in one space. Fifty percent of that child is you. Fifty percent of the child is the other person. But they're a hundred percent their own person. The, the only thing that we really have is that we created them so we have some responsibility to make sure that they have an opportunity to achieve. They, they have the opportunity to do something, to create something in their lives. We don't necessarily own them. We just have a stewardship and a mentorship that we have to make sure that we implant onto them. And that's a whole other topic. But back to your question is that you have to have those mindsets and those frameworks because I've lived it, everybody. Like I'm, I've, I've already preached this to the choir. I was the guy working 120 hours a week, and I saw what it did to my children. I saw what they wanted. Now, I will tell you that I do believe that you can do some really fun and aggressive stuff in your younger, you know, life or your second life, you know, of after children, all those fun things. I do believe that you can do some things, and you can, you know, as you said, kind of feed that inner hunger. And, and do what you really love to do. But you can't make that as the justification as to why you're not spending time with your children. So you have to find a way in which to do that. And what I recommend is, is that most children go to school. Uh, they have friends. They do things. Uh, I, I would kind of look at life and say, let's not be too crazy and put too much on yourselves. I know a lot of people are frustrated with public education. So they're looking for secondary style education, homeschool, all of that. Just, just take a breath for a minute and just like make sure you're not piling too many things on where you don't get some of that extra time for yourself in those hours and those windows of the day and, and encourage your children, you know, if they're of age to be social and to be active and to do different things. And, you know, there's ways to balance yourself in there. But what I would suggest is that you very, 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 very clearly respect your time between growing your business and personal and family time. And so what I mean by that is set up boundaries. This is something that I started doing later in my career. And I'm just going to tell you, I made more money doing this. I made more money doing it this way than the 120 hours burning on both ends. I just did. And it wasn't because, ooh, you know, I was longer in the journey. No, I, I did a startup this way. And it was the most successful startup I'd ever created. And and what I would do is, listen, my kids and, and my bride, it's like, look, mornings, I'm going to help drop the kids off when I can. I'm going to be there. I'm going to kiss them goodbye. I'm going to do that thing. But I get up at four o'clock in the morning and I spend from four to six. That's me time. I go work out. I do meditation. I do whatever I want to do. That's me time. Six o'clock. I get ready. I'm in the, I'm in the office. I'm doing my stuff from six to, you know, when the kids get out of school, which my kids happen to be at two forty. And then I always like to make sure if I'm in town, go pick up my kids, be involved, say, hi, how was your day? Do that little thing get them set in their homework, their chores. You know, we live on a ranch, so they've got a lot to, they've got to get done. And then I spend a couple more hours finishing up any things and around six, six o'clock, seven o'clock, I'm done. That's a lot of time that I spend in my day to make things happen. And then from seven to to nine o'clock is time with the family. We do family games, we do stuff. And then of course I've got my time with my bride at then. And then we have date nights. We have all these different things. We're not incredibly structured about date nights because we found that for us having this concept of every Friday we have to go on a date. Otherwise, we're not a good couple like that doesn't fit our lifestyle. We like to <laughs> yeah. be a little bit more sporadic than that. We, we actually like spontaneity. Um, it's kind of like if you're trying to have a kid and you're on the ovulation schedule, it's kind of a little bit crazy because it's not as romantic, <laughs> spontaneous. It's just I'm speaking real here. So, yeah, like, dude. I love it, bro. I don't love all this conversation about like we have to be have these perfect routines. I'm fluid in it, but I'm time management. And so what I would suggest to everybody is look at your time. And then you say, but Wes, I can't get up at four o'clock in the morning because I'm up till midnight da, 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 doing this or I stay up. Then stop. Like then stop because that's not effective. Your brain is not effective after a certain period of time. Listen, I'm in bed 9, 30, 10. If I'm up at 10, 30, like something's wrong. I'm dealing with a crisis. Because it's just rest is so damn important. And entrepreneurs are taught hustle, 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 you know, work in both ends. And if you have a job, then you should work from, you know, the time you get off work until two o'clock in the morning. Like, 
No, you shouldn't because your body needs to rest. Your body needs to have, you need to be able to combat the world. You want to lose weight? I'll give everybody a really awesome secret on how you can lose weight like instantly within days you can lose weight. Do not eat two hours before you go to bed and make sure you're in bed at a decent time no later than 10 o'clock. Boom, you're going to lose weight. Like guaranteed you'll lose weight. Like there are biological laws and one of them is we need sleep. We need sleep. And so don't give me the excuses that you can't wake up at four o'clock in the morning because you're up till midnight. Nope, that's wrong. You're not, you're not following the framework of how biology works. Get rest. Now, if you're doing swing shifts, all that we can talk. But, you know, a, a traditional, like trying to make something happen, respect that your body needs to regenerate, that your brain needs some time off, that you need to not be going. There are very, 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 very few human beings on the planet that can operate at their peak performance level without getting sleep. And the ones that come to mind, two of them have tumors in the back of their brains that are like effective tumors, not ne not necessarily ones hurting them, that give them kind of a superhuman advantage. And so like, unless you've got some insane things going on in your, in your genetics, which maybe you do, but for the average person, you've got to have that, you know, six to seven hours of sleep and some even a little bit more. And yes, you can oversleep, but you need to respect your body. You need to respect that time. And mornings are hugely, hugely effective for getting things done, massively effective. And, and one more tip, one of the biggest reasons that mornings are the most effective way to get things done is because no one else is awake. You want the best competitive advantage? Get up in the morning. And it's not because you can do things or send emails or do any of that. It's because your brain Okay. Again, biology, understanding this stuff. Your brain is an input machine. Like it, its entire job is to gather as much data as it possibly can and then filter through that data. And, and the filter system in our brains is incredibly lazy. It's filtering for two or three things. Is that going to eat me or can I eat that? Is that going to give me pleasure or is that going to hurt me? Like your brain is not filtering like all this, all the stuff that we think, you know, we're super smart and all. No, it's like very basic biology. Am I going to die or am I going to live? Like that's what the brain is filtering. So the more input that you're putting in, the more exhausted your brain is becoming and the less it actually has time for you to take the frontal cortex, the front part of your brain, the conscious development and actually start cross communication and bringing out ideas and pulling out memories and situations. And, you know, we're getting a little deep, but, you know, if you don't understand the, that in the morning there is less inputs that are hitting you. In the morning, there's less chaos happening. In the morning, there's less distractions, and you can become more focused than, than I mean, I'm speaking at deaf ear. Like, the morning is your best time for everything. Your environment is quieter. Your inbox is quieter. Your cell phone is quieter. Your social media is quieter. It gives you some time to really deep dive focus into what's happening in your business. And, and I'll just use one tiny little analogy to put this in. How many of you right now can think of, if I were to tell you, think of the place that you get the best ideas. 90% of you will say, well, it's when I'm alone or it's when I'm in a peaceful place. And when I dive into it a little deeper, it's the shower. Like you get your best ideas in the shower. I'll tell you why. You're safe. You're in a small space. Your brain knows I'm in a small space. Nothing can come and eat me. I am not going to have a saber toothed tiger jump over this curtain and kill me. Like I'm in a safe place. And guess what? Not a lot of distractions in the shower, right? Like you've got the soap bar. You maybe have some loofies or whatever they're called that your wife uses. But like for the most part, you're in the shower and it's pretty much not a lot going on. These idiots that I see putting their cell phones in the shower and like their iPads, I'm like, what are you're like taking away like one of the most creative places in your home? Like that the reason you can be so creative there is because your brain and everything on the biological level is at peace. Same thing as in the morning. Just think of that as an extended shower. Like it's it's so effective. And now you have a little bit more balance. I think balance is an unobtainable objective that we set out there to and right. we're not having a real conversation about it. And there's different times. There's different. I mean, when your kids are super young, men speaking directly to you, I get it. It's hard. Like when all your baby wants to do is cry and eat and poop, like it becomes difficult. I remember first time father holding my child and like all she wanted to do was eat and cry. And like, I don't have the, the assets to feed the child at that time. And so I'm like, 
what am I supposed to do? All it does is cry. My wife went to get groceries and like, I was just like, I'm the worst father in the world. And you know, she came home and I was like in tears. I'm like, I suck at being a dad. My kid doesn't even like me. Like, this is horrible. And you know, she whips out and all of a sudden the kid's happy. And I'm just like, see, I can't even do that. And like, you know, and I, I remember that feeling of feeling <laughs> like, uh, so be around for your wife, support your wife. If you're in this stage of your life. And yes, that gives you a little bit more time to go do what you want to do. But men, as your children get older, they're going to need you more. You know, they're going to need that mentoring. And I'm not saying anything against women. Women in the home is huge. If I could wave a magic wand and fix the society, it would be that we have a parent in the home all of the time. And we stop talking about, you know, being equal because we're not equal. We're unique. We're different. We have different assets. We have different things that we need to be doing for our children. There's different experiences. There's different things. Women are so much better in so many ways. Men are so much more, you know, giving in so many other ways. Like it's just stop trying to be everything and just be what you are and be excited to be that and be the best version of that you possibly know how to be and stop trying to live up to somebody else's expectations of success and redefine your priorities and then look at how you can create some time for you and look at what's in incredibly important and stop overthinking just just do cool dude that was a that was an epic rant and i loved it man you you hit on some uh, key key components uh, for all of us to step uh, into more of. And in the morning, I think you really sold uh, myself and, and other individuals to stop, uh, stop being distracted in the evening hours and to focus on a little bit of clarity each morning before the day begins. Love it, man. Uh, kind of two questions before we wrap up here. Number one, kind of uh, going back to the conversations of uh, parents interacting with the children, you said early on that uh, communication is, is really difficult now uh, today. Uh, in today's world with technology, all the other applications and stuff like that. What is it that we're not telling our kids or talking to our kids about? Um, I'm, I'm using this more as, as a father myself than obviously other people are fathers too or, or parents too. Um, what, what should we be chatting with our kids about more? Just how they're feeling, just, just who they are. Am I overthinking this question? Kind of, I'm just <laughs> curious. Well, I'll tell you the biggest thing that you need to do, and this is this is new. This is new to parenting when we look at it over the last few generations, is that it's always taken a village. Like, don't kid yourself. It, it takes a village. OK, my my son, uh, I, I'm an assistant coach on his football team. And sometimes I'll tell him to do something and he just looks at me like, nope. And I literally I have a great relationship with the other assistant coaches. And I'll just give one of the coaches a look. He knows what it means. He comes over, he takes care of my son and vice versa. And what I mean takes care of is he has the conversation and my son gets it, even though it's the same conversation I just tried to have with him. So it takes a village. However, the village is changing and the village is becoming a lot more uh, unpredictable and a lot more accessible and a lot less filtered. Really quick example. Daughter's eight years old. She comes home from school. She comes up to me and she says, Dad, what's porn? And I was like, uh, you know, like freeze moment. And I'm like, why do you right. want to know that? And how do you even know what that word is? Well, today at the playground, you know, so-and-so was talking to so-and-so because her dad got caught looking at porn and now he's in a lot of trouble. <laughs> so we're all trying to figure out what yes. porn is. And uh, I'm just like... That's great. Uh, yeah, I'm like, um, well, now pause the story for a minute. Rewind two weeks earlier. She caught a lizard, okay? She caught a lizard and she wanted to keep the lizard. If any of you understand lizards, they're one of those things that it's like it's a 15 minute joy ride and then it's a six month, <laughs> you know, nightmare. And yeah. and so I told her, like, OK, if you want to keep this lizard, then you need to learn everything about it and figure out how to make it a habitat, what it needs to eat and figure it all out. And so my daughter's very, 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 very good at research. It's what she loves to do. And so she dove onto YouTube and she's reading articles and she's doing all this stuff. She comes to me with this perfect plan of how she's going to raise this lizard and what she's going to do and blah, blah, blah. So then we went to the pet store and I bought her a cage and she took it from there. Okay, so just put that in your mind. She did all this research on her own. So now back to the story. I'm sitting here as a father going, you're like eight, nine years old. I don't want to talk to you about porn. Like, I have no desire to ever talk to you about it, let alone right now. So I'm going to do what any other parent does, and I'm going to say, honey, that's a topic that when you're older we'll talk about. So yeah. she looks at me and she says, okay, dad, no worries. I'll just go to YouTube. 
And I was like, <laughs> freeze. And she's going up the stairs and I'm like, stop, come here. Let's have a conversation. So I have a phrase. It's you or YouTube. Right. So I had to sit down and, and have this conversation with her. Either I'm going to take on or she's going to find it out in the world. And, and going back to what we talked about with with input and data is that my generation, 37 years old, when we were in the world, we didn't have a lot of inputs that were coming to us. We didn't have social media. We didn't have access to instant videos like we didn't have any of that. And now just think of how much data is being thrown at our children how much content that they are actually, you know, going and hearing, which means there's more curiosity, which means there's more questions. And if we're not in a position of honesty and integrity with our children, communication, it's going to be a massive problem. And if you've not been that way and you want to switch it, then just go be honest. That's it. Like parenting, I mean, there is no one, two, three magic pill. Okay. Okay. There is no one, two, three magic book there. It just isn't anyone who writes the perfect guide to parenting or the guide to parenting. That book right there is full of lies because there isn't anything like everybody is different. Every situation is unique. But the things that are true, the things that will never fail you are honesty, integrity, responsibility like these things will never fail. So if you have like maybe not been 100 percent. Uh, the best communicator with your child, go sit down and say, listen, I'm sorry. You know, yesterday I yelled at my kids. They were driving me nuts. They were fighting over a dog. Like I was just like, I, I mean, I had a long weekend. I, I'm human. I'm just like, kids, come on. What the heck is your problem? Stop yelling at each other. My son ran off into the forest. My daughter started crying. In that moment, I felt like a douchebag. I was like, you know what? I can't believe this happened. So I had my son come in. I sat down with him, and I just said, listen, dude, I love you so much, and I'm so sorry that I, I yelled at you. I'm just really frustrated that you and your sister can't get along. You guys have been yelling at each other all weekend. What can we do to make that happen? Had that conversation. Then I brought, the, you know, I brought his sister, and we had the conversation, and I just said sorry. Like, I, just because I'm older doesn't mean I'm somehow perfect. I mean, I still make mistakes. So if you're in this position and you're saying, ah, it's me or YouTube, what am I going to do? I don't have a great relationship with my child. Just go say you're sorry. Start now. Be honest. Yeah. Be vulnerable. Be real. It's okay. And don't overthink it. Just go with your gut. Cool. Cool, man. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, those comments. And again, it's it's just good to hear it from a different perspective. And thank you for bringing that stuff up. The last question I got for you before we uh, can find out more information about you and all the great things you're doing. This show is called Operation Self Reset. What does a reset mean to you? I love that. So a reset means to me is grounding. It's uh, in, improving the foundation that you're working on. And I have a, a real big problem with the word anchor because an anchor, understanding what an anchor is, an anchor is a device that stops you from moving. An anchor makes you stationary. So saying that you have an anchor in your life, it's, I'm not saying you're, it's wrong or evil. I'm just saying understand what you're saying. You're saying you're ha you have something that's always holding you there. And we don't mean it that way. What we really mean is you have, you're grounded, you have a foundation. And what understanding is, is that when you build a foundation and when you're building something, there are multiple foundations in a building. There is a primary foundation, the foundation that, you know, you set the cornerstones and you build off of, but then each level, each, each, uh, you know, floor in the skyscraper has a foundation. And if you see your life as this, you know, ever building skyscraper, you realize that you have all these foundations to build on. And it's OK to reset back to a, the last foundation that you were working on and get yourself regrounded in that. Maybe you misaligned, you took some wrong measurements and you got a crooked wall. Right. It's OK to, like, come back to the foundation, tear down. It doesn't mean you have to go all the way down to floor one. You may be on floor seven right now and you need to repair some things that are on floor seven. And so when I look at resetting, I look at it as just becoming more grounded in your foundation, what you're currently working on, and putting yourself in a position where that can actually be accomplished. So uh, everyone's different. I, I lived for a long time near a beach. The, the beach does nothing for me. Uh, it's overcrowded. I hate sand between my toes. It's not what I love. Okay? <laughs> Some people, it's what they love. Go there. That's awesome. Literally, as we're talking right now, there is a baby deer sitting outside of my window staring at me and I've never, I'm like super grounded right now. I'm like, this is awesome. Like that's my way of being grounded. Everybody's different. 
but find your grounded space because that's where you're going to have true reset. Don't try to have mm -hmm. reset driving down in LA traffic. Like this is not going to be very effective for you unless you're just like a really crazy person that loves to sit in LA traffic. I would love to meet you and learn your magic ways, but you know, just find your place of reset so that you can become more grounded in the foundation that you're trying to build at this moment. And think of foundations as something that you're constantly able to build upon and, and improve upon. And you may have to go down and remodel some of those floors in your skyscraper. And that's cool. Like there's nothing wrong with that. Awesome, man. Awesome. Great wisdom uh, through the course of this whole interview. Greatly appreciate your time. Wes, you're doing some amazing things out there. Thank you for sharing your message. Thank you for inspiring the next generation. And uh, thanks for continuing for, for your own personal best to be a great father and, of course, sharing that wisdom with us. Um, how can people find out about you and what you're doing and to be a part of a human project? So it's pretty simple. Google works. Uh, you're either going to find me or a famous <laughs> ballerina in New York. Um, I'm not the famous ballerina in New York. So what? Uh, I wish him nothing but luck. Yeah, right. I learned that actually at a roast. Somebody was roasting me and they were like, I Googled Wes. And anyway, so that's where I learned that. But um, <laughs> nice, nice. anyway, so uh, yeah, so uh, Google and you can find anything you want, but uh, some direct links. Number one, a human project. A is an Apple human project dot com that you will be lead, you'll be led down an amazing journey of seeing the problems that we're seeing in our society and the, and the results of the solution and the hard work that my team is doing uh, in that arena. And then secondarily, if you're an adult and you're just saying, oh, I just wish that I was around a community that felt like this, that was full of ideas and conversations and tools and all that fun stuff, then head to wakethehero.com. And it's all free. Dive into it. There's resources. There's, of course, there's something you can buy. I'm not going to, you know, lie to you. There's, there are things there. We do have, you know, upsell groups, things like that. But the, the basics of the con of the content are free. Wakethehero.com. Take a look at it. See if it's something that fits into your life, into what you're looking for, and then you can take it from there. So, Google directly go to ahumanproject.com. If you're looking to take your life to the next level, go to wakethehero.com. Cool. Wes, my man, I greatly appreciate you. Thank you for your time and good luck in the days, weeks, and months and years uh, going forward. Congrats. Thanks, Jake. Have an awesome day. Thanks again to Wes for coming on the Operation Self Reset show. Obviously, great nuggets, right? I mean, I think he's doing something amazing. He's talking to the youth, the next generation of quote-unquote leaders. And it's kind of funny. There's a lot of great uh, quotes out there in the world, and they say, you know, today's children are tomorrow's leaders. And I think that's very powerful. But why not you to be a leader of thyself today to make that impact? And there's one thing that I say on the show all the time. It's, you know, I, I, I force you guys, or I at least leverage you guys, or I try to force you guys to scream I'm freaking awesome and it's great to, to get messages from people on the impact of that message but truly it doesn't matter what lane you're in right now if, if you're gone through disaster and you're trying to figure out who you are or you're trying to figure out what your next big goal is or you're just wanting to learn some tools and tactics all of you guys are freaking awesome and you need to keep reminding yourself that every single day it's easier said than done. Life is not designed to be easy, but along the way, you need to start to build that self-belief. And I just want to remind, your, remind you how freaking awesome you are. And so, yes, look, we can stand in that power position. We can scream at the top of our lungs, but it's more of an intimate, I'm freaking awesome today because I really want to drive home the fact that, you know what, I don't know how much love or unlove you've had in your life uh, or how much... Uh, great people you have to support you. Um, I want to let you know that I'm here for you and I just want to tell you from the bottom of my heart that you truly are freaking awesome. You're special. You're you're amazing. You have great things to share and stop getting in your own way and, and start doing something a little bit different and for you to go out there and serve the world, serve yourself, serve your family and stop being distracted and stop letting emotions <laughs> run your life. Oh, man, it's just a whole slew of things here at the end but, um, but nothing more. I appreciate you guys and remind yourselves every single day you're freaking awesome and maybe at the end of this episode in particular instead of screaming at the top of your lungs I'm freaking awesome you can say to yourself and remind yourself and talk to yourself and say you know what uh, Jake, Joe, Jim, Susan, Diana whatever your names are 
I'm freaking awesome. I'm freaking awesome. I'm freaking awesome. Remind yourself of that great message because there's more powerful there's more power in it than you think. And the things that you say and you think, you start to believe. And from there, you create an impact for thyself and, of course, the people that are around you. And hopefully, you can pass it on to the next generation, your kids, your nephews, your cousins, and whoever. So with that being said, I applaud you. Thanks for listening in. Um, until next week, Wednesday, for another great show. And again, I'm trying to reach 300 reviews. If you could, please join me in that progression. Leave a review on iTunes. It would be greatly, greatly appreciated. I know your time is valuable. I know you got other questions cooler things to do or to see, but if you could take literally two minutes out of your day, you'd be greatly appreciated. I do this for free. I do this out of the bottom of my heart to help you thrive and become a better individual. So to all of us in the days, the weeks, the months moving forward, I appreciate you. And until next week, Wednesday, stay freaking awesome, be freaking awesome, and share a little bit of awesomeness with somebody that needs it. We'll see you.